All right. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter number 9. In this chapter, uh, if you recall from the last chapter, we, we left off, we, we looked at the first four trumpets being blown. In this chapter, we're going to look at the fifth and the sixth trumpets being blown. We're also going to look at a, uh, a phrase, uh, an item, and depending on your version of Scripture, what you're using, you're either, you're either going to see uh, shaft of the abyss or you might see bottomless pit. We're going to examine that briefly. We're going to take a look at that. What is that bottomless pit? Uh, we're also going to, and I mean briefly, uh, scratch the surface on a topic known as demonology. Uh, I'll tell you ahead of time, if, if what you hear, if you want to know more information, uh, a book that is out, and it's been out for a number of years, uh, is a book written by Dr. Walter Martin uh, called Kingdom of the Occult. And it is a, a, an excellent book. Uh, it's certainly not a book you want to read before going to bed. Uh, but the, the gentleman, and I, I, what's the other one? Uh, Ravi uh, Zacharias, I, I believe, uh, have done their homework in, on that work. And it's uh, uh, very, very informative. Uh, he, uh, Dr. Martin has done extensive research, research in the area of uh, uh, spiritism and cults and so on and so forth. And he's gone home to be with the Lord a number of years ago. But we thank God for his work that he has left behind. Let's pray before we start. Abba, we thank you for the day. Certainly this passage of Scripture. Lord, uh, what we're about to look at is deeply troubling, deeply troubling, and uh, uh, almost frightening. And, uh, and yet, Lord, we know that you're in charge, you're in control, and you have control all of all of what we're going to look at in this chapter. I thank these that are, that are here. I pray, Lord, that they, they have patience as it's a, a, a message that's not a short one, uh, but uh, it contains so much information that, that we need to know. And certainly bless us and, and prepare us really uh, uh, mentally, spiritually and emotionally for what we're about to read. And, and we're going to give you all the honor and the praise and the glory in Yeshua's name as always. Amen. So beginning of verse 1. Then the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star from heaven uh, which had fallen to the earth and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. He opened the bottomless pit and smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Okay, so we have this fifth angel he sounds his trumpet, and John sees a star. Uh, obviously, this is not something like a, in the celestials, uh, but a spirit. It's a spirit. John sees a spirit. And he sees this spirit, Now he write, what we see in English here, from heaven, which had fallen, past tense, to the earth. Uh, that Greek word, it can be translated heaven. It can also be translated simply sky. And I believe it should be sky, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Fallen angels do not have access to heaven. Fallen angels, and in particular, particularly Satan, does not have access to heaven. They don't. Now, normally you would immediately go, wait a minute, and you start flipping your Bible and flipping through the pages, and you're going to go to Job chapter 1. And you're going to read in Job chapter 1 in English that Satan appeared before God, right? And that's exactly what you see in English. And that's not what the Hebrew says at all. <laughs> the Hebrew simply says where you see in the English, and our English translators have chosen to even capitalize the word Satan. What you see in the Hebrew is simply hasatan. And depending on context, really all, all hasatan refers to is the adversary, the challenger, the one who stands in the way. That's what it means. And you've got to be very careful to automatically go and say, well, wait a minute, that's got to be Satan. Because in Numbers chapter 22, and we all know the story, Balaam is on the donkey. And he's riding down the road, right? And the donkey sees the angel of the Lord, which is a, what we see in Numbers 22 is called a Christophany. It's, it's, a, it's the, the, the manif or, uh, manifestation. It's the, the image of Yeshua as the angel of the Lord prior to his incarnation. 
his virgin birth, pre-incarnate Yeshua, angel of the Lord. In that instance, that was him. And he's standing in the way. The donkey sees him, Balaam does not. And in that passage, Numbers chapter 22, the angel of the Lord is referred to as a hasatan, one who stands in the way. And so we're certainly not going to say that Yeshua is Satan. So you got to understand the context. All right. Demons and Satan do not have access to heaven. Heavenly, heaven is a holy abode. And Satan was cast out of there with, with his fallen angels long time ago. They have no, they have no business being in heaven. Nothing, nothing unholy is in heaven. Heaven is perfect and clean and holy. So fallen angels don't have access to uh, heaven and neither does Satan. Uh, I've always been intrigued, uh, and we've discussed it in previous lessons and conversations. What did Eve see in the garden? Did she see a serpent? Did she see a snake? Right? Uh, would you be deceived by a talking snake? I mean, all the other animals are clucking and cooing and mooing and everything else, and here comes the snake talking. That kind of unusual, don't you think? So did Eve see a serpent? And the terms that we see in Genesis and in other places, are they simply metaphors? Even Yeshua said, that old serpent, the devil. Well, he also called Satan a roaring lion. So it's a metaphor. What did Eve see? I believe she saw a beautifully arrayed angel, and his name was Lucifer. And he appeared to, appeared to Eve. It was at that time, and, if you, and I'll read it to you, Genesis 3.14. Listen to uh, what Moses writes. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, what? Deceived, deception, pride. Cursed are you more than all cattle. And more than every beast of the field, on your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. I believe those are metaphors. And they simply refer to, you're not going to have access to the, he the heavenly realm anymore. You, he was cast out, and, he was, and where is his abode now? Earth. He resides, he, we use a personal pronoun, but Satan is a spirit, so he doesn't have gender. We use the personal pronoun, he. But he resides... In our atmosphere, he is a spirit and a very powerful one. So is this fallen star that John is seeing here, is it our adversary Lucifer? Very likely. In fact, I'll say probably. But we can't say definitively because that's not what John says. So we got that little, the, the door is opened up by just a little bit. We don't know for sure. But if you were to ask me, I'd say, yeah, that's, it's probably him. Whatever the case, this fallen angel does not have complete authority. In fact, the authority he does have was what? Given to him. That's interesting. And so he's given the authority. It wasn't his. And he's given this key. The key to what? The bottomless pit or the abyss. Now, you've heard me say it before. Bears repeating. The abyss is not hell, and the abyss is not the lake of fire. There is a literal hell slash lake of fire, but this is not it. It is the abyss, okay? Uh, the demons result, uh, re, uh, they inhabit two realms. Demons inhabit two realms. The air, our atmosphere, and this realm. The abyss. The abyss. And it's basically a dungeon. And this dungeon has kept hold on these demons for thousands of years. Peter mentions it, Second Peter 2, verse 4. Listen. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into Tartaros, is the Greek word that John uses. Now, in your English Bible, if you look up the verse, it says hell. But Tartaros is literally the deepest abyss of Hades. We'll get to Hades in a moment. So if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into this deepest abyss of Hades and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. So we have a realm known as the abyss. If you remember back Luke 8, you have the man possessed. 
and he sees Yeshua, Son of God, everything, and Yeshua says, what is your name? We are legion, for we are many. What's the next thing the demons beg of Yeshua? Do not command us to be put into the, or go to the abyss. Don't send us there. The other ones are there. Don't send us there. So these demons that we have that are loose in our atmosphere, they don't want to go there. They have freedom. What is scary, and we'll see in a moment, is the ones that are holed up in the abyss are far more powerful. We'll, we'll look at that in a moment. Okay. So these, they, and then, of course, Yeshua permits them to go into the herd of swine. And the old joke is that's where we get deviled ham from. But I, re, I digress. That was, that was a very bad joke. Yeah. And a bad one. All right. So demons don't want to be there. All right. But the ones who are there are far more powerful. Okay. What else is in this abyss? Smoke. John writes, like the smoke of a great furnace. Verse 3. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth. And power was given them as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So very reminiscent, it sounds like, of the eighth plague, Exodus chapter 10. Uh, <laughs> we don't live in an agrarian society, right? So we don't deal with crops and fields and things like that. But if we did, <laughs> we'd have to be concerned about locusts. Uh, Locusts, and, and again, I've never had, maybe some of you maybe grew up on a farm or whatnot, uh, wherever you were, but from what I've read, locusts, when they come upon, and they come as an army, when they come upon a field or a crop, they'll devastate the whole thing and just destroy it. Whenever you see locusts in Scripture, it's always, they're always a sign of God's judgment, and in particular, a good example is Deuteronomy 28. So what we're seeing here in Revelation 9, it's not an army of insects. It's an army of demons. It's an army of demons. And these demons have been holed up in this abyss for thousands of years so far. Our time. Our time. Waiting to be released. They're going to be released. And John says that they're not going to be released in order to, like Deuteronomy 28, how he used locusts at that time, to destroy vegetation. No, these are going to be released to hurt the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So we have the 144,000, which we saw last week, are 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. So you have the Jewish evangelists, and you have a number of individuals who have come to faith and are saved during the tribulation period but they haven't been martyred yet. A number of them have been martyred for their faith, but these haven't. We don't know how many. Okay, So notice they didn't have the power to do this before. In fact, the power was given to them. And power was given to them. By who? God. The Lamb. That's a fascinating statement when you think about it. That as much evil as we see in the world and, and wickedness and ungodliness, God is still in control, even of the demons. The demons can't do anything without him knowing about it. So what is going to happen here is that it's the lamb that initiates this. It's the lamb that initiates it. All these people have denied the Lamb. They denied the Lamb. They denied the cross. They denied the blood. They denied salvation and atonement and, and, and all of it. And now, guess what's happening? They want to hide themselves from the Lamb. They want to hide because the Lamb is going to execute judgment on them. Verse 5, And they were not permitted, these demons, to kill anyone but to torment for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. So they weren't permitted to kill anyone. Once again, God is in control. God is in control. And this is fascinating because what God is doing is he's using demons in order to do his work. 
pause and think about that. Now, it's not uncommon because you look throughout the scriptures. God has used the evil men to bring judgment to wayward Israel, right? He used Assyria. He used Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar steamrolled into Jerusalem, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. That was the work of God. But he used an evil man to do it. He used Pharaoh. He used a number of, of evil people down through the years when judging other people. Now he's using demons. Demons. What does it mean to torment for five months? Why five months? Well, that ironically, is the lifespan of a locust. Locusts do their work from May until September. Locusts hatch, they eat, they destroy, and they make more locusts. And then those locusts hatch, and they eat, and they destroy, and make more locusts. That's what locusts do. So this torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. Now, I don't think, I hope not, has anybody, no one, no one in here has ever been stung by a scorpion. I hope not. Um, I, from what I've read, I haven't. From what I've read, it's not deadly. Uh, it's not like a cobra or something. I mean, once you get that venom in your bloodstream, you've only got a certain amount of time, and, and then you go into cardiac arrest, and that's it. But with a scorpion, it's not going to kill you, but, ooh, are you going to be in pain? You're going to wish you got stung by a wasp <laughs> once you get stung by a scorpion. That, that's how, from what I've read, how bad it is. Now, verse 6, in those days, men will seek death, and will not find it. They will long to die, and death flees from them. What does that look like? I, I, I don't know. I was fa fathoming. I'm trying to get a, 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 a... So what? So they want to commit suicide, and they can't? I mean, they put the bullets in the chamber of a gun, they pull it, it won't work? I mean, I don't know what that looks like, but they want to die, and they can't do it. I don't know what that looks like. Now, before we continue, let's talk briefly, and I mean briefly, <laughs> about demonology. Okay. Demonology is the study of the dark side of psychic phenomena. There are evil forces outside of our dimension. Demons, we talked about it real briefly uh, in Shabbat talk, but demons are deceptive. Very deceptive. Satan is a liar and a deceiver. And they can fool you and they can trick you. They're very powerful. Demons can appear to perform miracles. They can. Okay. One of the reasons of many where the scriptures specifically say, test the spirits. Test the spirits to see if they are of God. Because demons can do the, the very same things the angels can do. Okay? Demons have ranks. Uh, in, our, in the angelic ranks, you know, we know of like Michael and we know of Gabriel and some of them we're very familiar. If there are more, we don't know of them. Well, demons have ranks as well. High-powering ranks. Some are more powerful than others. Now, Let's talk about briefly what can demons do? What can they do? What to look for? Uh, what, when you see things, what are you seeing? Okay. Let's talk about levitation. Levitation. It's when a solid object defies the laws of gravity. I share something with you. I'm not proud of it. Um, I wasn't even 10 years old, but I was coerced into performing in a seance. And I was told by this adult, we sat at a square card table, and we put our hands on top of the table. And I'm eight years old, probably. I mean, to me, it's a game. And we repeated a phrase over and over and over and over. Remember, what does Yeshua say? Do not use vain repetitions like the heathen do. And we use vain, and we just said it over for about 15, 20 minutes, this phrase, with hands on top of the table. And that table started to lift up off the ground with our hands on top. And I looked underneath, I saw it. The legs were off the ground, hands on top. S 
story is a number of stories. Um, John MacArthur uh, has done some a, a tremendous amount of work, uh, as Martin has done with the occult. MacArthur has done with the charismatic wing of the Pentecostal movement. He's got two books out. He wrote them a number of years ago, The Charismatics and Charismatic Chaos. In those books, he tells stories which are, they're documented, they're footnoted and endnoted. So he's not making up the stories. You can go and you can look for them, whether online or in their periodicals, like uh, uh, Charisma and others. But the story has it of a woman, and I forgot her name, who, Pentecostal preacher, who was on a stage at a revival, and she was preaching. And she's going, walking back and forth on the stage, and she's preaching, and she's preaching. And then suddenly she started speaking in tongues, like babbling, gibberish, right? She started speaking in tongues, and she's going back and forth, and back and forth, and that woman lifted right up off the stage and levitated off the stage and kept walking back and forth as she was off the stage. That's not God. See, God doesn't do that. Okay. Test the spirits. Okay. Apportation. Apportation. The, trans, uh, the transportation of one object or an object from a location to another by means not visible. Uh, somewhat like levitation. Uh, here, demons cannot inhabit an object. They can't inhabit an object. Sometimes you hear about a curse being put on a ring or an amulet or a bracelet or a brooch or a statue made of stone or wood or ceramic or whatnot. Demons cannot inhabit objects. They can't. They can move them, but they can't inhabit them. Demons have to have a live host like a person or an animal. So they can't inhabit an object. You can't put a curse on an object. They can move them, but they can't get in them. Okay. So demons can't inhabit objects. They, they have to have a living host. Uh, read a story of a seance, uh, 11 people, 1852 in Springfield, Massachusetts. 11 people took part in it, uh, sat around a table. They... Once the story was written, they all signed it. They sat around a table at a seance, and the table began to move in their presence, back and forth. Two men grabbed the legs of the table to hold it tight. Mm -mm. Kept moving. Then their chairs started moving with them sitting in it. Another story of a table in a, in a, in a woman's home. Uh, her, I think it was her son that was involved, started getting involved with the occult. And the kitchen table in her, in her kitchen started to move and rise. And she went and she grabbed a Bible and put the Bible on the table. Guess what happened? The table started moving faster like it was getting happy. See? Apportation. Materialization. Materialization. This is very important for us moving forward. Materialization, also known as an apparition. Demons, spirits, can take on the form of dead loved ones. They can do that. Okay? Again, remember this. When someone dies, if a person is saved, death claims the body until the trumpet, right? God claims the soul. Today you will be with me in paradise. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. So, the, the, uh, death claims the body, God claims the soul. When a lost person dies, death claims the body, Hades claims the soul and awaits judgment. Okay. You cannot reach either one of those realms. Say Hades or the heavenly realm. You can't reach it. Yeshua has even said there's a great gulf in between. And if you go out and try to get into that realm, you're going to hit the demonic realm. That's why you don't mess with the spirits. Okay. Now, there is an instance in our Bible where Saul goes to meet the medium. Right? The medium sits and all her entire career, she's been able to reach the demonic realm. Guess what God does in that instance? He brings forth Samuel. The Samuel. And what happens with her? 
She's scared to death because she had never seen that realm before. In that instance, God brought forth Samuel, but you can't reach that realm. And many people who do think they're talking with their dead loved ones, and they're not. They're not. Okay, you know, we know the story, right, where Hashem God and two angels appeared in the tent of, of Abraham, right? Okay. Now, once again, that was another example of a Christophany. And so those two angels that looked like human beings went where right after that? To Sodom to get Lot out of there. The men of Sodom, the homosexuals, wanted to have sex with them because they appeared to be human beings and they were angels. So angels can appear to be human beings. So can demons. It kind of makes you wonder, like, throughout my life, how many times I've encountered an angel and how many times I've encountered a demon. Makes you wonder, because they can do that. Story of a man, I've shared it before, uh, attended a seance. He wanted to talk with his dead sister. And she appeared before him. And she asked him, do I look as beautiful as you remember? And he goes, yes, you look as beautiful as ever. And they talked. And they talked about when they were children playing out in the yard. And they talked about Catholic school. And then he asked this question. So tell me, tell me about Jesus Christ. And she said, let's not talk about him. And he persisted along that line of questioning where she got agitated and left. It was never her. It was a demon posing as his sister. They can take on different voices. They can take on bodies. They can speak in different languages. Test the spirits. Test the spirits. Another story I read all in Walter Martin's book. Story of another seance where... Uh, a, a demon appeared in a human form and a physician was there and took the blood pressure and the heartbeat of the demon. Whoa. Test the spirit. Same. Demons have the power to take objects and change them into other things. We see that with the priests of Pharaoh. They took their staves, they threw them down. Our sign fell down on us there. They, th they th threw this, uh, their staffs down. What happened? They changed into snakes. Okay, that wasn't God doing that. So demons can take objects and change them into other things. Okay, demons can take the money in your wallet and change it to paper. Demons can go ahead and take paper and change it into money. <laughs> Crazy as that sounds. They can do that. Demons also have the ability, and particularly you see this, Satan does this one, where Satan, a demon, can take a moment in time somewhere else on earth and present it to you as a vision. Satan did that with Yeshua after he had fasted for 40 days. If you recall, what did he do? Took him up on a high mountain, showed him the kingdoms of the earth. Bow down and worship me and I'll give you all of these. He showed him a vision. So Satan has the power to do that. Okay, now let's start to reel all this in and discuss the powers of the spirit realm which tie into Revelation 9. Okay, there are those of you, right, that, not that you're involved in it, but know of voodoo in the Haitian culture. Okay, uh, there's also witches and witchcraft. And in this particular, what I'm going to teach you about is witches and witchcraft amongst Native American Indians, and in particular the Navajo Indian. Now, you'll be hard-pressed to try and f find a Navajo Indian that's going to discuss what I'm about to tell you. Okay? Amongst the Navajos, they have what are called skinwalkers. Skinwalkers. Even amongst the Indians, their traditional law, very prideful people, amongst traditional law amongst the Indians, once you become a skinwalker, their words, you forfeit your right to be called a human being. You've now turned yourself over to full demonic pos uh, possession. And what the skinwalkers do is at night, 
they have the ability to turn into animals. And what they do is they prey on people. They attack people. They terrorize people. And the Indians, once you reach that, and you can actually shape change into animals. Okay, so that's what all these spirits are capable of doing. Why did I go through all this trouble to teach you this? Because what we're about to look at, and starting in verse 7, if I didn't teach you this, you'd think you were looking at a comic book. And you're not. This passage of Scripture has been misapplied by prophecy teachers and pastors and so on. It's almost like, well, he's, John's talking about modern warfare and uh, 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 Apache helicopters and, and uh, battleships and ballistic missiles and tanks and so on and so forth. And I'm here to tell you what John is talking about is real. Verse 7, the appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. And on their heads appeared to be crowns like gold and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like the hair of women. And their teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots of many horses rushing to battle. They have tails like scorpions and stings. And in their tails is their power to hurt men for five months. You would think you're reading a comic book. And they're real. These demons have been released from the abyss. And as John says, they're prepared for battle. They've been preparing for years and years and years. And he writes, on their heads appear to be crowns like gold. So they have a higher rank than the ones that exist in our atmosphere now. Think about that. Faces of men, hair of women, teeth of lions. They have wings. You'd think you're reading a comic book. The demons can change into any form they want to. They can change into a horse. They can change and have a scorpion's tails. They can change into your dead loved one. You don't mess with that realm. They can speak in different languages, different voices. Read of a story in Walter Martin's book of a man who was performing an exorcism on somebody and had to call Dr. Martin on the phone. And, and, was, and, and Martin could hear the demons in the background over the phone. He could hear them. And he says, Dr. Martin. He goes, they're speaking in all these different languages. And Martin said, you command them, his word, you command them in Jesus' name, you command that they speak English to you. And he heard the man say, in Jesus' name, I command that you speak English to me. And immediately everything went silent and they started speaking English. It's not a joke about They're going to torture people, he says, with their tails for how long? Five months. So what does that mean? It means if God can determine the lifespan of a locust, some simple little insect, God's going to determine this span of time that these demons are going to inflict punishment and torment and pain on people. Verse 11, they have his king over them, the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in the Greek he has the name Apollyon. So this king, uh, this angel of the abyss, is it Lucifer? Probably. If it's not, then it's some very, very high-ranking fallen angel. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. In the Greek, he has Apollyon. Now, it doesn't really matter what language you use. Both terms refer to the word destroyer. Destroyer. And that would lead you to believe that it is Satan because Yeshua said in John 10, verse 10, what? Satan has come to what? Steal and kill and what? Destroy. Destroy. He's a destroyer. Verse 12, the first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. In other words, the worst is yet to come. As bad as it's, as it's been, it's going to get worse. Verse 13, then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, one saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. So once again, we see this golden altar. We were introduced to that last week. 
right? The golden altar, it's before the throne. Same thing. Same thing, same angel. So this angel that we saw, chapter 8, informs the sixth angel to release this plague. What's interesting is that we have four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. They're not good angels. (laughs) You never see good angels in the Bible bound. (laughs) They're not, God doesn't bind them. You bind the bad ones. Okay, what's this Euphrates business? Uh, Listen, all we do know is this. Euphrates was a landmark of ancient Babylon, and Euphrates, the Euphrates River, was the boundary of the old Roman Empire. Now, how that plays into this, hey. But you see, especially in the book of Genesis, how Euphrates uh, uh, is always associated with rebellion and sin and revolt and those kind of things. So... Uh, At any rate, what exactly will these four ranking demons be leading? Verse 16, the number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And this is how I saw in the vision the horses and those who sat on them. The riders had breastplates the color of fire and of hyacinth and of brimstone. And then the heads of the horses are like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths proceed fire and smoke and brimstone. A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which proceeded out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. So when I, when I read this, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, and I, I've made plenty of mistakes in my life. But I remember like weeks ago, I said the largest number in Greek is 10,000. So where's this million coming in? So I start digging. And that, okay, yeah, that's right. So what John wrote is this, dismuriades myriadon, which literally means 20,000 of 10,000s. 20,000 of 10,000s. So he's saying it's an innumerable number. It's, it's a number I can't even begin to count which is pouring out of here. Now, uh, this, is, this is one of these passages where guys who are trying to write books and become something, they make the error. They read the t- word 200 million, and Hagee was one of them, where he, they read the 200 million, and they say, okay, well, there's got what army on earth today has an army of 200 million? Ah, China. And so they plug China into... They take the square peg and ram it into the round hole. And that's not what John wrote. If you take 20,000 and you multiply it by 10,000, you'll get 200 million. But that's not what John wrote. John wrote 20,000 of 10,000s. That means I can't even begin to count them. This isn't a human army. It's a demonic army that is coming on earth to enact these plagues. A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which proceeded out of their mouths. Imagine, Revelation 6, a fourth of mankind had been slaughtered then. So by the time this trumpet's done, half the world will be dead. Half the world's population will be dead. For the power of the horses in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents and have heads. So they can attack from front and back. Now, here, you have all this, we've seen bloodshed and we've seen torture and we've seen pain and we've seen water being turned to blood and, 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 and on and on and on. Surely by now, surely by now, those who remain on earth they're going to drop to their knees and they're going to beg God for forgiveness, right? Verse 20. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood which can neither see nor hear nor walk nor did they repent of their murders nor of their sorceries nor of their immorality nor of their thefts. What is frightening What is frightening about the chapter, it's not about 
the, 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 the faces and the lion's teeth and the horses and the scorpion's tails and the fire. and the, That's not what's frightening. What's frightening is in the midst of all of that and all the torture and all the pain and stars falling and celestial disturbances and bloodshed, people are still going to sin. Just look God in the face, blaspheme his name, and just continue to sin while God is judging them. Think about that. That's bizarre. That's why sometimes we get this idea, when, if people wind up in hell, they'll regret. No. They'll be more furious than ever. The works of their hands. See, look at what we've done. Look at, look at the buildings we've built. Look at the cities we've amassed. Look at the technology we have. Look at what we've done. Look at the works of our hands. To worship demons. Satan has been wanting to be worshipped since the garden. If you just bow down and worship me, if, I'll, I'll give you sex. If you just bow down and worship me, I'll give you fame. I'll give you glory. And how many people, actresses and actresses and musicians and corporate fat cats and, and politicians, kings and princes and all the... How, imagine how many down through the generations have sold their soul to Satan just for power and sex and money. It happens to this day. Happens to this day. Idols of gold and of silver and of brass. Money. Wealth. Look at what I have. Look at my portfolio. Look at my bank account. They did not, he said, of stone and of wood. Look at my home. Look at my mansion. Look at my yacht. Right? Look at my clothes. Look at my closets. Look at my jewelry. Look at, you fool. <laughs> what fools? They did not repent of their murders. You remember, there's going to be a ration on food. People are going to be killing each other just for food. No repent. No repentance. They did not repent, now this is interesting, of their sorceries. And the Greek word that John uses is pharmakia. Oh, where we get the English word pharmacy. Pharmakia. Why? Now, pharmakia, the, the initial uh, uh, definition of pharmakia is... Source, uh, no, actually, the initial definition of pharmacia is, is drug use, the use of drugs. But the third definition on down is sorcery. So why would sorcery be involved with drugs? Because they go hand in hand. Every time you look at the occult, every time you look at magic, witchcraft, voodoo, and on and on, you're going to see drug use every single time. That's why I'm trying to tell you. It's like when you do a little bit of homework and you look back at the pagan temples, hundreds of years before Yeshua was born, hundreds of years, Plato wrote about it. <laughs> How did they worship in their temples? When they went to a temple, one of the ways to worship was what? Have intercourse with temple prostitutes. You could have a man, you could have a woman, whatever. Okay, so that was part of the worship. Bring a sacrifice, but what else? They wanted to talk with the divine. They wanted to get and immerse themselves into the spiritual realm. And so how do you do that? Hypnosis, self-hypnosis, the beating of loud drums, of music, of drugs, uh, ancient drugs, torture. They would cut themselves. They would whip themselves with whips. Anything, because if you can remove the, if you can inflict as much pain as, as you can on yourself, the mind will escape the body. The mind will escape the body, and they thought, the pagans thought, they'll be able to talk with the spirit realm, the divine deity. And guess what the result of that was? Gibberish. Gibberish and babbling and ecstatic utterances. And they were doing it hundreds of years prior to Yeshua even being born. And they thought that was a heavenly language. Folks, that's why I get upset and it's like insulting when I hear Pentecostals and Charismatics within that say that that's a heavenly language when it's mimicking what the pagans did 
hundreds of years before Yeshua was ever born. What you're basically saying is that God looked at, in Acts chapter 2, he looked at what the pagans were doing and said, wow, that's a great idea. I think we'll do the same thing. No. No. Drug use and the occult, they go hand in hand all the time. Nor of their, they didn't repent of their immorality, homosexuality, I'm afraid to even say it, bestiality, when you get it's, uh, into, into darkness and, 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 and wickedness, right? Rape. Nor of their thefts. Imagine a world without, <laughs> without police, gangs, rioting, looting, and on and on. How are people going to be stopped? There's no Holy Spirit to keep anything in control. So in conclusion, in conclusion, I mean, what are we looking at? We're looking at a world of no morality, no conscience, no godliness, um, immorality, no Holy Spirit. Oh, but the Antichrist is there. And so I'll take care of everything, right? The Antichrist, he's the one. He made the covenant with Israel, and we're going to have peace. He came as a peacemaker, and he's anything but a peacemaker. He came as a promise keeper. He's, anything, he's a promise breaker, and we're going to see that moving forward as we continue on through. His true character is going to come through. They always say, like, you know, they say, you know, cream rises to the top. Yeah, well, so does scum, and we're going to see that. Let's pray. Abba, we, uh, Lord, it, it, what we see, it, it'd be very easy. Uh, it, it's a troubling passage, troubling passage. Um, your fury being poured out on mankind, mankind that has denied you, that rejects your salvation. Um, we, we look at, Lord, we, we, we're puzzled how people would not, fall to their knees and worship you and love you as we do now. Lord, and that, that's not going to happen. And, and so it troubles us. But, but Lord, in the midst of this, help, it, help this book to continue to not just inform us of what you're going to do, but again, give us hope. We, we, should, we as believers, we should rejoice because we don't have to go through this. Uh, you've, you've prepared a place for us. And, and, it's, and it's under the shadows of your wings and in your love and in your, in your mercy. And that's what we look forward to. Uh, Lord, help us as we continue to go through this book uh, just uh, systematically and verse by verse to, to help us understand uh, that, that we can use what we have learned and what we studied and, and so that we, we can not only help us to, to continue to have the hope that we have, but to share with others the, the, the tragedy that's about to happen at some point in our future. We lift all these matters up to you. Bless us in spite of us. In Yeshua's name, we pray all these things, Lord. Amen.